my uh, interest in effects, uh, particularly monsters, uh, goes back to childhood. Really, I, you know, I um, my father uh, was a fan of special effects movies and makeup and so on. So he probably let me see some things uh, at a young age that you know maybe I shouldn't have seen. Um, and uh, I just kind of always was tinkering in the garage and making little films and, and so forth. And, and basically, I think I was never told by anyone, uh, any, any adult uh, authority figure, that I shouldn't do it or couldn't do it for a living. So it was just sort of a foregone conclusion that I would, I would go into becoming a monster maker. And were there any um, films that you can remember that were particularly inspirational? Yes, my father would show me uh, movies that uh, over my mother's objections, and sometimes he would wake me up, you know, uh, at nine or ten o'clock at night, and you know, when I was like five years old, and say, "You got to come see this," and I'd come out and be rubbing my eyes, you know, "What's he talking?" And it would be Ray Harryhausen, you know, movie Jason and the Argonauts with the skeletons coming out of the ground and sword fighting, and I think something about being a little kid, impressionable little kid, and having just awakened these images were kind of burned into my brain and um, they had they just started me off on a, a, a life of fascination with uh, creatures and effects and and my dad knew a little bit about how things were done you know he could tell me that the original King Kong was that big and so w it was just an amazing world to me that these these incredible visuals could be created um, by you know, the use of miniatures or, or rubber or, you know, mechanical means. And so I just had to, uh, I was just always, I always wanted to peel the, the layers off and, and see how things uh, were accomplished. It's interesting you mentioned Jason and the Argonauts because Steve Wilson said the same thing. That was a, a, a kind of a turning inspiration for him. Yeah, the work of um, Ray Harryhausen, the stop motion animator, was uh, influential on a, on a huge number of people of my generation and, and before. You know, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg also uh, uh, cite him as one of their big inspirations. I know Steve Wilson, the, the writer and producer of the Tremors series, um, loves it as well. And uh, it's being passed on uh, to a lot of younger people. Um, because it's it's got a uh, uh, his his work was so expressive and it was he was at the center of it so he he was an artist who was expressing who he was as an artist n not just through the stories that he was creating in, in these films but also in the movements and performances of of the characters that he designed so for me when I realized that there was a single person who was responsible for most of my favorite monsters, I thought, well, that's what I gotta do. I've gotta be that person. Did you ever meet Harryhausen? I did get to meet Ray Harryhausen. Uh, you know, once when I was about 16 at a convention and I lined up and had him sign, autograph my book. And then later on, um, Tom Woodruff, who's my business partner in Amalgamated Dynamics, Inc., um, just said, hey, listen, we're in London. Uh, you know, we were working on Alien 3, I think it was, and he says, let's just call, let's just, I think he looked through the, the phone book and found Ray Harryhausen and called and explained who we were. Tom was very good at, at doing that, and there we were. We found ourselves in his, um, in his uh, home and uh, talking to him, looking at his collection, and um, it, was, it was a fantastic moment um, for us. He, was, he had long since retired, or was 10 years retired, uh, but still very enthusiastic. And then we met him. Um, he came to our studio afterwards. We, you know, we invited him when he was in Los Angeles. And, um, but he was very gracious and uh, very talented and an independent filmmaker. He, he doesn't get credit or doesn't get referred to, I should say, as an auteur, but that's what he was. He didn't direct his films, but he, uh, he created them. He created them through his artwork and he structured the story and then he chose the director, and uh, and they were all independent films. You know, he he uh, he was a firebrand, and he even in his 80s, I, I can remember him sitting in a chair in our studio, and he was ta 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 talking about his frustrations with uh, producers uh, of a certain mindset, and uh, and uh, what a problem they had been for him. And he was pounding the chair, saying they don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. And here was this guy who was like, you know. Um, 
well beyond the point where you'd think it would matter to him, but it was, it was still, he was very passionate, and uh, I always appreciated the chance to meet him. So how did you initially get involved with Trans? My partner Tom Woodruff and I um, had founded a company, our company, uh, ADI, Amalgamated Dynamics Inc., in uh, 1988, uh, after we left Stan Winston's. And at Stan Winston's, um, Stan was one of the great, um, uh, you know, sort of pioneers of the bigger uh, animatronics and makeup studios. Um, and we worked for him for a number of years on Terminator and Aliens and Predator. And we really um, were working on a high level of, of motion picture at that time. And in 1988, we formed our own company. And um, we had had an association with Gail Ann Hurd. And uh, that, that was there for Terminator and Aliens, et cetera. But I had also known Gail from my Roger Corman days, which predated um, my Stan Winston days. So uh, when we heard about Tremors, or at the time it was called Beneath Perfection, it was because it was a phone call from Gail Hurd, who said, I'm gonna send you a script, you're gonna love it, uh, you need to do this, this job. And of course, we were like, uh, you know, we had just started the company and we were poverty stricken and we were like, we didn't even have to read the script. But we did, and when we did, we were thrilled by it. It was just so unique and, and the tone was so apparent on the page. Um, and that's when we started meeting with uh, Steve and Brent and, and Ron and Nancy. Can you tell us who Gail Ann Hurd is? Gail Ann Hurd is um, uh, a, an uber producer, a genre producer, who um, got her start uh, in the Roger Corman days. Um, I think she, I met her when she was uh, producing Humanoids of the Deep and I was working on a movie called Battle Beyond the Stars. And uh, Gail is unique in that she's very educated, uh, comes from a well-to-do family, and kind of, um, I remember somebody saying, oh, her secret is that she's not doing this for the money. She actually doesn't need it. She's doing it because she loves movies, she loves telling stories, and if it's not gonna be done right, she doesn't wanna be involved. And uh, it was a great, um, it was very interesting to see her uh, work and to see her carry herself because she's such a pro and has uh, great judgment about story. And she's a very well-rounded filmmaker um, and producer. Um, and uh, so when we got the opportunity uh, to work on Tremors through Gale, uh, of course we jumped at the chance. Can you describe what your life was like back then? In 1987, I think it was, um, I had worked for Stan Winston for a few years. Tom Woodruff um, had worked there for five years. And Stan did a little movie called Pumpkinhead that he directed, and Tom and I were um, part of the, the team that created the effects for that film. And Stan at that point announced that he was uh, not going to be doing effects anymore for uh, for the movie industry at large. He was just gonna do them for his own films. So that meant, to me, that meant, oh, I don't get to work with James Cameron or Robert Zemeckis or all of these other filmmakers that I'd hoped to work for. It will only be for Stan. I love Stan, he, he was my mentor. Um, but he was also carrying a kind of a big crew of people out of loyalty. So I thought, well, you know what? I'm, I'm not in this to, I'm in this for my own self-expression. And, you know, I'm an artist. I've gotta make my own way. So. I told Stan that I, um, that I was ready to leave, and he very quickly said, well, thank you very much, because <laughs> I think he was happy to have me off payroll. Um, but it was all, it was all uh, with the best of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, intent, and we were, we were friendly uh, about it all. And Tom came to the same conclusion shortly thereafter, and we were kind of kicking around going, well, what do we do? How do we, you know, I've got a wife who's expecting a child and just bought a house. And he's saying, yeah, I just bought a house too. And what are we going to do? I think Tom had a little kid at the time. Um, so we thought, well, maybe we'll team up, uh, you know. Um, and we had a script that we had written that we had presented to Gail Hurd. And it got a good reaction. Her people really liked it. And we thought, oh, naively, we thought, here we go. We're going to make a little movie. And uh, we'll, bring the, we'll bring the project back to Stan and you know, Stan's guys can do the effects and maybe Stan will want to direct it. And 
And of course, uh, as these things go, um, it didn't. <laughs> and uh, so the movie never got made and, and then we were worried. And then we were saying like, uh, how do we make a living? What do we, so, um, so we decided to, you know, start a company. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's what, after some languishing and after, uh, you know, a lot of worry, uh, Tremors was the first feature that we did as ADI. So Tremors was a really significant film for you. Tremors is a very significant film in, in my career. Um, I, you know, it's what we built our company on and it provided us um, a calling card for future films. Because you can leave your mentor, you leave the nest, and you have worked on, you know, the Predator and and uh, Aliens and, and other projects. But unless you've proven yourself, then everyone sort of thinks maybe it was the big guy, not you. And uh, and and we became viable. And and also Stan um, Stan was good. He would recommend us for jobs. He told me once, "I'll recommend you for anything that I can't handle, but I can handle everything." And uh, so we, but we did get some um, recommendations and referrals from him, which was very helpful. So when the um, brief arrived to design the Black Rose, what was the first thing that you did? Well, uh, the design of the Graboids was very loosely described in the script. Um, I, th I believe it was a really nice, kind of loaded little sentence. It it, it said the the worm's head opens up like a grotesque flower. And we thought, that's evocative, right? It doesn't take a lot of words to, but that's really all the description was. They had, there was a conversation, what are they? Are they prehistoric? Are they, you know, are they alien? And so we liked the ambiguity and the script never answered the question as to where their, what their origins were. So that gave us a lot of freedom to, to start designing. And then, Steve Wilson, uh, Brent Maddock, Ron Underwood, and, and um, Nancy Roberts were great partners in the design process because we all saw things just automatically in the same way. We wanted it to be biologically feasible and reality-based. So Tom and I would bring these books to the meetings and spread these nature books out, and everybody would page through them. We would have gone through and put post-it marks on, on um, images of uh, creatures that that we like and and then it just became sort of this blender of like well here's what everybody likes here's textures that people are responding to and 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 things that they're that they don't respond to and and what your what the director doesn't respond to is every bit as valuable as what the director responds to so we just started um sketching and um doing loose drawings and i remember at some point there was a sketch that i had done that um steve really responded to and he kind of championed it as the first step towards towards what these worms would be our our concern was that we did not want to just repeat dune because you know when you whenever you get a job you look and you go okay what has been done like this and how do i avoid that and there had been a couple of things there was a there was an outer limits episode that had land sharks i think they called them that were like swimming through the sand and um, and then you had Dune, which was perhaps the most famous of a desert, you know, sandworm. Uh, and, and we wanted to make sure that we avoided that. So what we did was we like, well, let's give it a hide like a dinosaur. You know, let's give it a, a kind of, we were calling it pterodynamic, you know, a, a pointy skull that could ram through and everything would move. It's so sort of like a, a you know, a, an aerodynamic or aquadynamic design as well, but it would need a, a very bony head in order to be the first, you know, spear through the, through this, through rocky terrain, all that kind of stuff. And then of course, uh, the, the, in the script, uh, the Stephen Brent had written this idea that not only did this, this thing undulate its way through, but uh, it had these spines that would push it, that would push. And uh, we thought that was a really cool touch too. And, and these are filmmakers that think it's important enough to have a character go, look, these things must, you know, we always like that. This is why Tremors is so wonderful to us because it's got a foot in the old 1950s, uh, you know, desert creature movies, you know, where people stand around, they go, what do you think? Well, look, this must do that. And then, ooh, it stinks. And all these details were just so, um, so wonderfully flushed out for us that, that there was a subtext already there and all we needed to do was like, you know, latch on to it and, 
do enough drawings and get enough feedback that we could hone the, hone the process down to the, to the final design. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he, he, he sort of suggested that you did, in the early days of ABI, did quite a lot of flyby, um, maybe with Dell or, or um, Mercury. Did you have to build your own oven? Yes, we, the beginnings of our studio were quite humble. Uh, so humble, in fact, that our studio was a table at Marie Callender's restaurant in Toluca Lake. Um, we didn't have a studio when we first started talking to Nancy and Gail, um, but we didn't necessarily want them to know that. We didn't lie about it, but we just didn't invite them over and, you know, uh, we would say things like, well, where are you guys located? They go, well, we're, you know, we're in Culver City or whatever. And we'd say, they'd say, where are you? We're, we're in the valley, uh, you know, as we're lying on the carpet of Tom's unfurnished, you know, house. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, but uh, so we would say, why don't we meet you halfway? There's a Marie Callender's in Toluca Lake. So that became our meeting spot. And that's where we'd have our creative conversations. All the while, we were like, as soon as that first check comes in, we're going to rent a building. We've got it all lined up. And of course, nothing ever goes to plan. So when we got our money, the, uh, the building that we had made a deal on was behind schedule because apparently that's, um, if you're a contractor, a building contractor in Southern California, you don't give a crap about deadlines. Um, anyway, uh, so we ended up renting some space from our, our friends at K&B, which is, which, you know, theoretically should have been our rivals, but we're also our pals, uh, you know, Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger, Bob Kurtzman, who had worked on a number of projects with us. And so we got to, you know, rent space from them and they actually came and helped sculpt. And um, so we were, we were on our way, but yes, humble beginnings. So um, can you um, walk me through the kind of first incarnations of the gravels from like the original drawing to the kind of final one of the first ideas that uh, Tom and I had, um, we were kind of smitten by the uh, heads of snapping turtles, which, which did survive into the, into the look of the, of the finished graboid, that kind of hooked beak sort of thing. Um, but something snapping turtles, some snapping turtles have, which is pretty neat, is that they can draw their heads back into this pile of flesh around them and sort of extra protection. So we thought that would be cool if they, if they ram up and they're just sort of this like, you don't know what this thing is. It's just like a, a giant muscle, you know, that comes up and, and then this head extrudes out from inside this flesh. And we did some sketches and Gail said, this is not going to be a movie about giant dicks chasing people through the desert. And we were like, oh, I guess it does kind of look like that, doesn't it? So we circumcised the worms and um, exposed the 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 head of the worm um, and 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 it was a really nice you know we just thought there might be an extra beat we we're actually riffing on what Cameron did with the queen where when you first see the queen the head pushes out from under the shell um, and, but that didn't you know it was a totally different application and uh, Gail was right she was correct she said I showed my uh, this drawing to the women in the audience there's no way we're making a movie like that. <laughs> so we learned our lesson, and uh, we were grateful to Gail for that observation. Yeah, because I was going to ask, how does circumcising it make it less phallic? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on which uh, part of the world you're in, eh? Uh, how do you go about constructing a gravel? How do you, I mean, they're enormous. I mean, yeah, the graboids were... Uh, one of the larger creatures that had been done as puppets, if you will, uh, at that point, um, and certainly for our shop. Uh, so we had to really sort of think hard about how we were going to accomplish this. And what we came up with was we, we pitched a split between full-scale and miniature versions. Um, and this split had worked well on aliens, and Gail spoke that language. We'd all been through that together. And so we said, like, you know, let's have, you know, a, a, a decent schedule of a miniature tabletop shoot wherein we can have full body worms that are squirming around. We'll do them in a variety of ways. We'll make them hand puppets. We'll make mechanical 
cable operated tentacle mechs and all that kind of stuff and we'll put them in miniature sets and you may as well get the Scotech brothers Robert and Dennis who won an Oscar for uh, Aliens to do all that work and we'll put our monsters into the and Gail was like no brainer that's perfect uh, then that left us with the full scale which was well how are we going to accomplish it at that time in our career we had not done big hydraulic mechanisms um, and not a lot of people had for uh, for movies, especially when you start thinking, well, these are going to be out in the desert with the grid of the sand. We got to dig deep holes and put these, you know, heavy mechanisms. In. So we're like, eh, let's just make it a big uh, body puppet, right? We'll put Tom Woodruff in the puppet at times, and uh, so we built a rig that Tom could hold the head up and it had a support on it so it took the weight off and then we had other puppeteers uh, you know off screen with 20 foot cables leading to giant levers that would open and close the mouth um, and between those two approaches you know we created the illusion of these very energetic and athletic uh, uh, monster worms. Um, How big is that? The full-scale puppet, um, we built the front maybe seven feet of it. Um, so the head of it was about half of it, three feet maybe, and then another four feet. Because the great thing was, um, and Steve and Brent were champions of this, you know, like, you know, let's, let's save our powder. Let's show the creature initially as puffs of dust or a rustle of a bush or a, or a a, a fence post that falls over, a mound moving past you, right? Those are the things that psychologically st start activating your brain and your imagination and your fear. Don't show everything too much. And when there are attacks, there's nothing wrong with them coming out only a certain amount because this is natural behavior, right? Like there are sea creatures. You can walk along the, uh, the, you know, the beach and see little crabs that just stick their feelers out and they're grabbing it you know whatever food might come by but they don't waste the time they don't they don't risk their bodies to come out but then as you, as the story goes on you would see more and more of them and that's where more miniature work would would come into it how long did it take to build that puppet i think our build schedule for the creature effects on tremors it was probably 3 or 4 months it was not a long time because it was not a big budget film um, and we, uh, luckily we hit the ground running and, and we had a lot of fast response from, uh, the, the director and the production team. They could give us notes very quickly and they were also very active. They would come to the studio a lot. You know, this was in the days before you could just snap a picture with your phone and text it to somebody. Um, so they were there and they were, they were very appreciative of the process as well. Um, so that, that was, uh, it was a very joyful process with them. Um, and, uh, you know, we kept it simple. We, we didn't, we didn't, we were working uh, on a large scale, but we tried not to complicate the, the internal, uh, uh, mechs of the, of the thing, because that's where you could really start tripping up. And, and what materials do you use to actually make it? Well, we, to create the graboids, we would start with, uh, a clay sculpture, a full-scale clay sculpture. It was pr at least a ton of clay. Uh, and then from that, we would make large fiberglass negative molds. And then into the negative molds, we, we would pour our, our foam latex. And foam latex is, a, is a, a fantastic material that I think its first use was on the Wizard of Oz for facial appliances. <clears throat> but it's a very, it's, it's comparatively lightweight and comparatively durable you have to do a lot of reinforcing but basically you're doing a big giant skin of rubber and creating a, um, an understructure inside it that holds its shape i think in in our case um, we ended up just doing hoops of aluminum so it was like a big hoop skirt so we could get some jiggle out of it and you could have a person inside it operating it and you know creating a lot of activity uh, our goal was to make it as lightweight as possible but when you get into this kind of sculptural detail that we had going on on that character, um, you can't really use theatrical techniques or theatrical materials like gossamer fabrics and things that you see in stagecraft. It has to be, you know, it has to look like the real thing. And, and along with that, 
uh, those specs come some weight issues as well. So we had a lot of exhausted puppeteers. Tom Woodruff, as I mentioned, uh, was in the hole a lot, doing a lot of the puppeteering. And then I was outside the pits with, uh, with our other puppeteers uh, directing the performance of tentacles coming out of mouths and uh, jaw parts opening and closing, and et cetera. Did they need a lot of maintenance? They were pretty, uh, despite Bert Gummer and his efforts, they were pretty bulletproof. Uh, sorry, I apologize for that joke. <clears throat> um, they were pretty, because they were sturdy and they were simple. And that was, the, that was our, our marching orders. You know, we had, they had to be lightweight enough that we could just yank them out of a hole, four guys carry them over, throw them on the back of a pickup truck and drive them out to the second unit and install them out there. So, you know, we didn't want to get into a, a situation where we had heavy mechanisms that w would be in need of repair and maintenance all the time and that you couldn't transport without a forklift. The heat, the cold, the dust, it doesn't make it easy if you're transporting and working with a massive leather travel. Yeah. We, our, the movies that we had done prior to that, uh, like Aliens, tended to be indoors, in the dark, lots of slime in a cold weather conditions. So for us to be out in the desert um, was a blast. I mean, you know, it was like, it was like, uh, it was a lot of hard work and a lot of heavy lifting um, and a lot of choking dust and goggles and respirators. But it was really like, uh, when you think of aliens and tremors, both of which were using similar practical effects techniques. They were such vastly different experiences um, that we were just uh, always, um, we just always felt fortunate to have been involved in the movie. Did they have like their own truck or how did you actually move them around? Production, uh, production rented us a, you know, a rental truck, a big, you know, rider rental truck. And we just like outfitted it with wooden shelves and it was all very indie style. Um, <clears throat> we learned a lot uh, on that. Um, and we just threw everything in the back of a 16 or 20 foot truck and had our PA, Stefan, uh, drive it up to Lone Pine from, from our studio in the San Fernando Valley. And then I brought my uh, little Honda uh, hatchback. Uh, it was like an 86 Honda hatchback, 85, maybe, I don't know. I bought it for a thousand, no, I bought it for $5,000, this car. And it was a workhorse. It had a red plaid interior. Um, and we just would throw crap in the back all the time and drive it around as if it was a willy wagon or a Jeep or something. And uh, it survived. It survived the whole shoot, you know. And did the graboids ever sort of break down like mid shoot with any of the hydraulics clanging or anything like that? We occasionally had some breakage of the graboids, you know, that, that happens cables will snap, you know, especially when you're puppeteering, like we had, you know, big levers and cables that would open and close the side mandibles and the jaw, but that, those mandibles would bash into the ground, you know, we would, we would dig a hole and then create a, a berm around it, and then we'd have to sort of, you know, place the, the creature out past that berm so its mouth could open, because it didn't have the power to like just push dirt away, but there were times where when the coordination of the puppeteerian gets out of sync and the head rolls and somebody gives it a good yank to give a good strong opening and it just hits the ground, it's not going anywhere. So that force has to, you know, it snaps the cable and then you have to stop and uh, replace the cable or more than likely what, more than likely what it would do, it, it would break the cable at the um, controller end. So we would just cut the housing of the cable, pull, you know, pull more, uh, pull more of the, of, the, of the cable itself out, wind it around the pulley and go. So, the, so as we shot, the controllers were getting inching towards the, the creature uh, regularly. And then we'd take it back to the train station where we were uh, based and, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day and, and start making repairs. And we repaired things quite often, repainted things and, um, because we put them through a lot. 